This message is brought to you by DoNotAge.org, the longevity research organisation that's on a mission to extend health span for as many people as possible via products that actually work. Start your journey today at DoNotAge.org and use code LAMA for a 10% discount. That's L-L-A-M-A. When I asked all the, the elders that I spoke with, I said, "What's the? if you could offer me one piece of advice to live a long, healthy, happy life, what would it be? Overwhelmingly, the answer was, hold no grudges with those around you, maintain good relationships. That was the big thing that they all shared. Hello and welcome to the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. I'm Peter Bowes. This is where we explore the science and stories behind human longevity. Now, they say you should spend a lot of time with like-minded people, people who share your interests and passions and enthusiasm for what you do. Well, hopefully today is one of those days. My guest is Jason Prawl. Jason is the host, director, writer, producer of the Human Longevity Project, a film documentary series looking at longevity from the perspective of lifestyle, food, drink, exercise, spirituality, all of those aspects of life that we cover here every week. In fact, I think we've probably, Jason, spoken to some of the same contributors. Welcome to the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. And, and can I really quick chime in and say I love your title of Master Aging? Because a lot of the problems I think that we have is that we, we demonize aging, right? We have this tendency now to anti-age and this fear of aging. And so I think I think you hit it on the head with mastering aging. Yeah, I see it the same way. And we talk a lot about the science, but and I almost see mastering aging. A lot of the elderly people I speak to, you know, the 102-year-old lady a few months ago, they master what I call the art of aging without necessarily understanding the science. They've just done things right. And yes, they might have been blessed with the right genes as well, but they've lived the lifestyle that gets them to that great age. Absolutely. And if you ask them what generally why they think they've lived a long time, they'll give you some non-answer. You know, it's a God, God's decision or I have no idea or because it's, oh, it's always something vague, right? So the, in other words, what that showed me was they, they don't think about it. They just live in a good way. And yeah, maybe you get there. Maybe and a lot of them say it's luck. Yeah, a yeah. lot of them say it's, a lot of them simply don't know, yeah, and they exactly. know what they've done. A lot of them will highlight aspects of their lives that they think might have got them to a great age. Like I know there was a famous Italian woman who ate, and this has got a lot of headlines: three eggs, eggs a day. Yeah, yeah. If you actually delved into her life history, she had great genes as well, and her yeah. mother lived to a great age. Her grandmother as as well. So people will think that they they don't drink and therefore alcohol, and therefore that gets them. Others will say, oh, yeah, I have a whiskey before I go to bed every night. 100%. So it, pinpointing what it is is actually quite it's, difficult. It's very funny. And, and a lot of the people that we spoke with in Costa Rica, they would say corn. And so, yeah, it's always something that they try to point at. But but really, you know, I think the essence of it is, is it's, uh, it's luck. It's in God's yeah. hands. It's whatever, right? It's just the, the, the reality. Yeah, exactly. Know? So as I said, I think it is probably fair to say we have a shared fascination. We've shown that already f- for this subject. What, and it's a fascination for how to optimize health, in my view, extend health span. I would say lifespan. Maybe that's not so important. It, it's health span that, that matters. Where did your fascination come from? Was there something that happened in your life that just set off that light bulb that made you think about this? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I started in the integrative functional medicine type space, right? So I uh, was working with disease, right? So people with autoimmune disease, cancer, you know, digestive issues, hormonal imbalances, these type of things. And and what I, what I re- kind of realized was that we're starting to understand disease processes better. You know, I think there's a movement in integrative and sort of complementary medicine that is now getting more toward the root of the problem, right? Which is good because we need to understand disease. But what I felt was lacking was this discussion of health and where is, what is health and, and, and why, where does it come from? Why aren't we discussing health? And, you know, it got me to thinking that perhaps we don't need to understand disease better, but perhaps we need to understand health better and understand life better. And if we do that, then disease just doesn't occur. And we don't need to understand disease. So, you know, sort of that that sort of thinking point, I guess. And then, of course, there's been a lot of work done around the world looking at, at older people and centenarians and these type of things. And I said, well, it's a perfect model for which to explore this idea of, of understanding health. And so that's, that's just kind of what we did with the Human Longevity Project is, is we wanted to go talk to these people. And I think there's a, there's a sort of prescient aspect to this, which is that I don't think it's going to be around much longer in a lot of these places. These places that are known for their longevity, uh, it's pretty clear from my 
experience in these places and talking to these people um, and just, you know, looking at the trends. Um, they're not going to be known for longevity, I think, in, in the next 20, 30 years. Uh, I think the generations are, are changing and the lifestyles are changing. And so for it, me, it is was that like, because they're becoming westernized. hundred yeah. percent. I, I mean, technology is everywhere right now. Right. So the technology is moving in. The ideas are changing. The, the ways of the past are now uh, lost. And so they have now moved into this modernization, and it's simple things that people don't understand. They, 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 just simply electricity showing up in 1970 in, in various in this Greek island that we went to, uh, electricity showing up in 1950. Every old person that's over the age of 70 that we spoke with didn't have electricity when they grew up. So that right there, and then we can get into the implications of that, but but that's just one example of, of technology, and we don't even think of it as technology because it's been around our, our entire lives. Um, but that type of thing leads to a whole host of lifestyle and environmental changes that have impacts on our health. And unless we are very conscious about this, uh, using these technologies in the right way, they have the potential and power to destroy our health. So I think this is what we, we wanted to sort of – this last-ditch effort to go and talk to these people – to, to help us understand their their lifestyle and their ways growing up because the historical context for their health, I think, is so often forgotten. They, we, we have this perception that a 100-year-old grew up the same way we did and it couldn't be further from the truth in the Western world, let alone in some of these places around the world. Very, very different lifestyles and we have to look at that. Because a common thread is often the simplicity of their lives and the, the simple ways, and as you say, not having electricity or, or whatever. Uh, clearly, that was forced upon the lifestyle. Yeah. But the simplicity for a lot of those people has actually continued as they've got older. And that, to me, seems to be the great value in their lives. I couldn't agree more. And I think if there is one takeaway, it is that. It is simply that, that their life was simple. And... Um, you know, I had one guy tell me, and this is, it was probably the most powerful thing he told me. And unfortunately, it wasn't on camera. And we were just talking to him. It's uh, always the way, isn't it? I know, I know. But he, 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 I said, you know, you know, what's going on? What's, what do you see happening? Uh, you know, as, as time has progressed in your, in your village, in your area. And he said, you know, when I was growing up, and of course, this was in another language through a translator. But he said, uh, when I was growing up, the, the mind was still and the body was busy. Now I see that the body is still and the mind is busy. And I thought, wow, this guy gets it, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I couldn't agree more. They see it and, and they understand the value of very simple things. And I think because they grew up in a time that was didn't have the convenience that we have, they understand and appreciate the little things more than we do. Nobody appreciates water coming out of their faucet it, it just by, by flipping it over. Nobody appreciates that because it's there. And what, how it's very hard to appreciate simple things like that when they're just part of your life. And so – but we also don't appreciate – the value of healthy water because we don't see healthy water, you know, and, and uh, people may not understand that, but that's uh, the water that we drink is terrible uh, coming out of faucets. And the, the, when you talk to these older people in some of these regions, they were drinking waters from mountain streams and they understood the value of that water. They understood the health aspects of that water. In fact, one guy was telling me that that was the primary aspect to longevity in their village was that they were had access to the most amazing mountain water. And he, he knew it. This wasn't like, oh, I think. He's like, no, this is sort of the elixir of life is this amazing water. So so I think we've, our, we, we don't understand the, the where to place our, our values and mm -hmm. how to appreciate things because we are just living a life of abundance and convenience. And yet we... At the same time, paradoxically, we are lacking the most fundamental things that are good for us. It's, it's that paradox, isn't it, between balancing technology and advances that are clearly good in many respects, but not forgetting the simplicity of life and the, the basic nature of, of life, yeah. that uh, they need to go together. And I think that is the challenge to, to learn and, yes, use technology and use medicines as, as necessary, but not to forget the simple ways of, of doing things. So I want to delve into that a little bit more, but just I asked you about you and your life. You actually have a, an engineering background, don't you? Yeah, yeah. I came from engineering. I was in, in that field for about 10 years and uh, yeah, it just wasn't wasn't really a passion. I mean, and, and that's ultimately what it was for me. But, you know, I, I realized that I fell into engineering because I was a good systems thinker. So I was often confused on what to do with my life um, for, through college and even after college. Do I want to be – do I want to go to grad school and, and do move into patent law? Do I want to do some sort of finance thing? Do I, do I want to, you know, be in the education field? Right? It was always something I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And engineering just made the most sense because I was good at math and I could solve problems and these type of things, right, think logically. And 
you know, it just I got slapped by universe enough to to get out of that and follow a more more of my passion. And but it it really translated well to human biology, right? Because it couldn't be more complex of a system than the human biology. Um, and there's actually a good argument to be made that we are not human. We are actually more bacteria and virus and all these things. So, you know, there's a big network effect going on. And so it transitioned really well to see the big picture. And I think I'm very grateful for this. The fact that I didn't get educated in this in the system. I was not educated in naturopathic medicine or conventional medicine or functional medicine or anything. So in, there's not to say that that's bad uh, to be educated in those fields. But what it allowed me to do is to be a free thinker. So I could, I could pick and choose what I thought made sense to me. And I could leave what was not, was not valuable. And so you, know, you, you kind of have to find your own way. But I think there's a lot of value in that because I had to practice everything that was coming into my mind, right? So in other words, I had, I had, to, I had to use the, the skills that I was developing. And if they were not useful and successful, then my business didn't work, right? So uh, there was a lot of value in sort of me sussing this stuff out. And um, I, I'm forever grateful for that because it, it really, really taught me where to look for, for answers. And, you know, I made some mistakes along the way. Okay, I started following this and I was like, oh, that didn't work. You know, so you, mm-hmm. so you, you kind of have to double back a little bit, but you don't get locked into a paradigm. And I think that's so often what's happening in medicine is that we get locked into these paradigms because we've invested so much of our time and energy and, and, and money and emotion into whatever paradigm we walk down. And it's very hard to undo your own paradigms and to say, oh, well, that, that was a waste of four years of my life or eight years of my life or $200,000 or whatever, right? So, and, and especially well, if you I mean, have debt. Yeah, and you can't really see anything as a waste. It's all the, it's all the long learning process. That, that, that's what I, I think that's the better approach, unfortunately, but, but it's not taken sometimes. So, so I think you're totally right. I think we have to just recognize where we want to go and, and, and forget you know, the mistakes or the, the, the things that we picked up that maybe don't work very well. Mm. I had to do that a lot with science. I mean, you know, you've learned a lot of scientific concepts that are completely wrong and you have to throw them away because they're, they're just wrong. So what was the educational process switching from engineering to biology? What did you do? Well, I mean, a lot of it was for, came from my own health issues, right? So I had, I had knee, uh, knee pains and knee issues from 13 years old. And this affected my sports career, you know, uh, in college and all these things. And uh, I never got a straight answer. Nobody could ever f- tell me what was going on. And I had skin issues, same thing. I never got the answers. And so it, it was through my own pains and issues that I was sort of forced to, to, to open that, that box. And, you know, it's Pandora's box. Once you go down that rabbit hole, you start to realize that what we're taught and what we're told by the medical system, by the food industry, by everybody is wrong. And it, not, not only is it just kind of wrong, it's really wrong. And so once you kind of figure that out, and for me, it wasn't a matter of me- mentally deciding. It was like I had to apply this stuff. And basically, in order to get myself healthy, I, I had to listen to whatever that was, right? So it's literally a matter of like trying these things. And I, I was given the answers as I, as I went because of what, what, what worked and what didn't work. And so through that process, that self-application process, I could understand some of these things and break down the paradigm rather quickly, uh, which allowed me to sort of you know, get off and running. So you didn't initially become a filmmaker. What, what did you do? What did your new profession become? Uh, I mean, I would still say I'm not a filmmaker. I, I really brought a filmmaker on board uh, to, to really create this process, uh, this, this film. But, um, you know, it, it's really just a way for me to flush out the ideas that I've had. And um, I think we did a pretty good job of that. Um, fortunately, we've had a, amazing experts that were able to sort of help us do that. But, um, you know, was, that's really what it was. It was, a, it, was a, it was an idea of like, okay, I have this message and I keep, keep teaching this to my clients. How do I get this out to a, a bigger audience? You know, and, and, and it's really not a message of longevity. I hate to, hate to sort of spoil the, the title, but that's sort of the Trojan horse, I guess, if I, if I could be totally transparent. Um, it's more about living the way we want to live. And which is healthy and happy and um, to do the things we want to do. And, and if we can't – the longevity thing is cool, but I'd be satisfied with 75 living an amazing life and dropping dead after, you know, walking up a mountain, right? Mm. I mean – Yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's what we aim for, isn't yeah. it? Whether it's 75, 85, 95 – Or 200. Yeah, yeah. Like, it doesn't Whatever. matter, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's quality of life. You mentioned your clients. So uh, you, you're an educator now. Yeah, I, I think this is what we need right now. We need – Doctors and practitioners of all kinds uh, educating people. We don't, the doctor doesn't heal you. No practitioner heals you. Mm-hmm. Um, the body heals itself, right? So this is, I think, the fallacy that, that we've been you know, following, which is that if I go to the right doctor or the right practitioner, that they're going to have the answers for me and they're going to do the thing to me or for me. And it's never the, it's never 
the way it works. So we have to be educating people and not only educating them on the what's really going on with their disease or dysfunction or imbalance – because that's important to understand sometimes, but I think more importantly, how to we need to be educating them on how to live a life that is conducive to health. And you're a health coach, is that uh, how you describe yourself? I, I can I describe myself as just a guy, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, really optimal health practitioner, health optimization practitioner, these type of things, uh, you know, practitioner of some sort. But um, you know, I, I do testing, I do functional testing, I, you know, I do all kinds of things like that. But but at the end of the day. You know, what really matters and what really moves the needle is is getting people to understand that their decisions, their thought processes, their emotional states, their lifestyle in every way is what's going to drive health. And if if you change those, then you not only get the resolution to your symptoms that you're experiencing now, but you get to avoid a lot of pain going forward, right? And that's that's the key. So what motivated you to, you say you're not a filmmaker, but you're certainly very deep into this and you've made many, many hours of film around the world. And this comes out in very shortly in a series of, of documentaries that uh, and you've talked about the, the use of the word longevity as a kind of umbrella expression. But yeah. where did you or how did you decide where to go and who to speak to? And we'll continue this conversation in just a moment. Hey, quick question for you. Are you someone who wants to be fit, healthy, and happy? And what if I told you you could get your dream body by simply just listening to a podcast? I'm Josh. And I'm KG. And we are the hosts of the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast. Listen, we get it. Fitness isn't easy. Carbs, no carbs. Just stop, okay? It doesn't have to be that complicated. And that's why we made this podcast. We get straight to the facts so you can become your best you. So the way to check us out is click the link in the show notes or search Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast on any of the major podcast platforms. We'll see you soon. Well, we, we, we looked at, at work that's been done uh, in the past, you know, and, and really we didn't want to study a region or an area because I actually don't think that's important. I don't think a, a specific place fosters longevity. I think it's the people and their lifestyles and the way they live is really what matters. Um, so we just tried to find the societies that have sort of demonstrated that. Um, around the world, and there's lots of them. I mean, you can go to the Amazon, and there's there's tribal societies that do this. There's you know um, places in the Himalayas. I mean, there's just a number of cultures. And so, um, I think what we wanted to do was select cultures around the world that were different enough so that we could break down this uh, this garbage about diet. Right? We have this idea that that there's a quote unquote certain diet that's good for longevity, and it's just completely nonsense um, because you see diets all around the world that are completely different, and they all foster longevity. Um, and this idea of genetics, right? So these two paradigms, I think we need to break down and and understand that it's not genetics. Uh, that I look at genetics like cars. You know, some people have a Ferrari, some people have a Ford Focus. Neither of them are, are any better or any worse at getting you from A to B. You know, they just do it in a different way. And you can you can do it. You can they can have a long life if you take care of them, right? So so I think the genetic component um, really is is it not totally accurate. And so, and we explain why, uh, Mm. because there's things that turn on genes and turn off genes and they involve your decisions and your microbiota and your mitochondria and all these things. But there does seem to be some element of the the longevity gene existing. There are some people who get to a very, very great age and haven't necessarily, you know, through the eyes of most sort of sensible thinking people done things particularly well. They might have smoked, they might have had particularly bad diets, they might have not exercised, and they still get to a great age. Yeah. And uh, it's a bit of a mystery why. And th- this sort of phrase, the longevity gene has been has been coined is that they must have something. So, so here's, here's what the way I would address that or think about that, because I don't know that we can ever find the answer to that, right? Uh, but here's how I would think about it. We can never measure their emotional states or their mental states. So perhaps they were so happy and so in tune with being in the now and being present and, and loving life, that that is, despite what they ate or drank or did, that that is really what carried them forth. So there's that. Um, the other part is, is that we know that the birthing process, what happens in gestation, uh, is critical for longevity. So we always look at longevity basically as something that happens from 25 on. As I would argue that basically preconception to 18 to 20 is by far the most critical aspect of longevity. So we don't know what they did at that point, right? So that's, that's one of the other aspects. Now, if we want to get to biology, we know that mitochondria are the most important factor in terms of what's happening inside the cell when it comes to longevity uh, and disease. And the, the mitochondria have their own genes. 
So if we want to talk about longevity genes, perhaps we should look at the mitochondria for genes. And we know we only get those from mom. So mitochondrial genetics comes from our mother. So how, how healthy was our mother? So if we want to look at longevity in genes and look at, try, to, try to look at it from that angle, I would say, okay, let's look at the, the female lineage and see what kind of mitochondria we're dealing with. Uh, because if we get good mitochondria from mom from birth and we get all the other things you know, pretty much right, then that's probably a good recipe. Um, the other aspect is we have microbiota and bacteria, in, not just in our gut, which that's becoming a bigger science, which is great. We have them in our brain, our liver, kidney, on our skin, in our skin, literally everywhere in and around us. And they have genes. So perhaps those genes matter more than anything else because they dictate about 90 plus percent of our function probably. You know, we're understanding more and more. Every time we're like, oh yeah, they do this now. So what I'm hoping to paint a picture of is, is that this is much more complex and it's not about you. Oh, it's, it's not about your genes. Huge. I mean, you mentioned the gut, gut health, the microbiome, which are rapidly e- expanding yeah. areas of, of growth of, of research that are clearly so crucially important to us. Yeah, it's the, the, it's... It's, I think what's going to happen is that we're going to understand that that's really where the answers lie, uh, is that these microbes, these viruses and bacteria and all these things. And the reason is that because they are the most rapid sensors of our environment. In other words, they help our human body, whatever that is, uh, understand the environment around it, the light, the pressure, the temperature, the, uh, you know, the, the biome of the soil, the foods, everything. They are the things that are sensing that stuff first. And then they basically, you know, through metabolites and other mechanisms, they communicate to our mitochondria, which are inside our cells, and our, our DNA itself. So we have all these mechanisms to understand the environment. And if our, if our biology understands our environment really well and is in harmony with the, uh, the, the, the environment, and the environment is healthy. So there's two components there. If you're in, the, in an unhealthy environment, then your body probably doesn't have a great shot at, at doing the right thing. If the environment is healthy and you're not doing the right things by interacting with that local environment, then you're also probably doing yourself a disservice. So if we have a healthy environment and we integrate with that healthy environment in a really, really natural way, then our biology goes, oh yeah, okay, we know what this is. We know how to do this. This is what we're going to do here. So it is the rapid sensors that are our microbiota and our maybe less rapid sensors, which are our mitochondria, that communicate to our DNA and our genes and say, okay, turn on this, turn off that. This is what we're doing at this time. Do, do this at that time. Then we start to harmonize, right? And we find this balance and this harmony with our environment. And I think that is really the key. So it's, it's this integration with, and it's the microbes that do this. They, fil- they facilitate all of this. So again, I think we have, it's, what's really comes out of this, if you take this to the, to the end, is that we have to stop being so egocentric, and start thinking about the bacteria and the, the viruses and all the microbes inside of us and on us that are helping us and, and basically using us as a petri dish to, to extend their life. And think about our outer ecosystem. Forget so, about the eye. And so with all of that in mind, and you've been to a lot of these quite simple societies, as we've mentioned, and perhaps societies that don't include harsh cleaning fluids or damaging toothpaste or that kind of thing that can damage the very the environments, yeah. the internal micro ecosystems that you're talking about. What have you learned that you maybe apply to yourself in that respect? I mean, I've always been uh, always I, I, lately in the last 10, 12 years, I've moved towards more of a minimalist lifestyle. Right. So getting rid of all the harsh stuff as, as much as I can. And, and that was critical for my skin stuff. I, I had to start doing that. And that's where I started opening up Pandora's box of like, OK, this stuff, all is, it's all toxic. Right. Uh, and it matters. So so reducing that stuff. But but I think more importantly, the, what I've really recognized is to eliminate waste in all aspects of my life. Right. This simplify everything. And this not, not only products, but clothing. Uh, the content you consume, uh, the people that you hang out with, where you dedicate your time, money, energy, et cetera. Reduce all of it. Because if you go to these areas, and this is, I think, the key component um, that I'm so f- happy that I got to experience, which is you have to be there. You have to feel it. And when you go to these places and you feel it and you understand it, time slows down. The quality of time, right? is literally changed when you go to these places. And then you come back to the U.S. and it's like you're late for everything, right? And nothing's changed, right? You're just all of a sudden late and you don't know why. So I think we have to recognize that simplifying our, our entire lifestyle is really going to be the, probably the biggest service that we can do for ourselves in terms of our, not just our health, but our happiness, right? You, you ever notice when you take something to the Goodwill or you do a spring cleaning or whatever, you just feel better, right? And you can describe this in feng shui, you can describe it however you want, but really it's this mental and, and emotional and physical clutter that I think we need to get rid of. 
Physical clutter, mental clutter is huge, yes. I think. And we're, I think we're drowning in it. Huge. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And, and, and the emotional clutter, I think, is, is also a component that, that we're, we're drowning in because, yeah. you know, because of the political climate, because of all the things that are happening right now. And, and things are changing. And that's, and that's probably a good thing. But it's very emotionally uh, chaotic, right? So I think this is where things like meditation and any sort of mindfulness-based training or, you know, what have you, or getting in the zone in whatever it is, art or music or whatever it is for you. Um, I think can can quiet that stuff down. So I think if we can just start decluttering everything, uh, then then we stand a better chance of being happy. Just to delve then a little deeper, then in terms you've mentioned a few of the things that you've decluttered your, your clothes, the, the the way that you live, the number of friends that you have. How do you achieve that? Because it's not going to happen overnight, is it? You've got to work on it. Yeah, I think I think the first thing you have to do is you you have to look at. But this is the first thing I had to do was look at what's affecting me, right? So how do I feel about this? And, and so it's it's sort of tuning in to what you need and what you don't need. I mean, a lot of us hold on to things that we have some emotional attachment to, whether it be that shirt that I was given, or whatever, right? I mean, there's all kinds of these things. And you, you recognize that you have to look at it for what it is. I have this weird emotional attachment to it. I never wear it. I never do anything with it. It just sits there. Uh, why do I want to hold on to that? What is it that I'm tr- trying to hold on to? Just in case tomorrow or the next month. Yeah. Or- it's the it's, next year. Exactly. So there's something. There's always something emotional attachment. And it can be a, something that you're keeping in a, a file cabinet. I mean, all these things. And so I think we just have to, beca- have to gain awareness of what it is we're actually trying to hold on to. And it's always emotional. I think the point is, actually, we think we've got an emotional attachment to these things. But actually, we haven't. Uh, uh, and we you, don't miss them. To, I, you probably said it better than I did. Yes, absolutely. I think you're, you're dead on, which is that we are misperceiving the need for some of these things. And, and this can be things in the kitchen. I mean, when you go to a lot of these places uh, around the world, and this is not just the longevity places. This is most places. They don't have a need as much stuff. You know, they, they, they get by with so much, with so little, I guess. Well, you don't, you don't need much in the kitchen to steam a few vegetables. Do no, you? I, I, I pull an apple off a tree and you eat it, right? I mean, like, this is what we've gotten away from is the simplicity of, of all this stuff. Uh, but, yeah, I think you have to just recognize. You have to, it's, it starts by building awareness. And then I think you can let go of the people that are, you know, energetic vampires and really causing you disruption in your life. It's a hard thing to do, but... If you just are aware of it, and then you can start to get rid of that. You know? Energetic vampires. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. <laughs> I mean, and I think we uh, probably know who they are. A hundred percent. And and the hard part is, and I, I work on this with clients: is they can be a husband or a wife, they can be a mother, uh, they can be a son, um, they can be really important people in your life, and it's really difficult sometimes. But I think if you're looking, if you have a real health problem, autoimmune disease, cancers, you know these type of things. I found that it's almost always – there's always a massive emotional component to it. And, and oftentimes it's from childhood, but oftentimes it's actually stuff that is manifesting in our current life that we can you know, help resolve. So I think – I mean you could probably see an example of that when you just simply get into a stressful situation and you feel that knot. Oh, it's crazy, stomach. right? There's a, a classic example of yeah. it's not physical. It's yeah. all mental. It's something that's around you. It's the interactions that you're involved with. Yeah, well, and, and the Buddhists describe this in a very interesting way, um, which is that when we don't understand our patterns and our emotional states and, and our sort of subconscious mind, um, the first thing that in any situation what happens is a physical change. So in other words, somebody cuts you off in traffic. And before you flip them off and yell at them, what actually happens is, is your, your physiology changes, your hormones change, right? All these things physiologically happen first because you're not aware of how to understand your subconscious and you're not aware of that. So the subconscious mind creates physiological changes in the body and then the body manifests in this imbalanced state and then you project that, right? And so uh, I think, again, it's, it's a very interesting thing to try to think about, you know, the sub- subconscious mind, this trauma but when we can just sit with that a little bit and try to understand it, and then we can start to see how we behave, it's like, whoa, I really overreacted there. And not judge ourselves for it and be okay with it and be like, whoa, like, where did that come from? Like, what is that pattern that's in me? Because it's a pattern, right? And I think we have to recognize our own patterns. And when we start to do that, and it, it can be a long process. But as you start to uncover that, I think it's just, it becomes so much easier and you start to see how silly we all are. Uh, and yeah, and that ability not to, to bear grudges yeah. and to forgive. It's huge, isn't it? So you want to know that 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 was the most common answer that I got. Um, When I asked all the the elders that I spoke with, I said, what's the – if you could offer me one piece of advice to live a long, healthy, happy life, what would it be? And overwhelmingly, the answer was um, hold no grudges with those around you. uh, Maintain good relationships. Uh, That that was it. That was the big thing that they all shared was that that was the key for them 
was to have good relationships and, and these are hold no grudges. disparate groups around the world all around the different world different we're not talking to each other not emailing each other saying hey what's our answer here yeah. so you know when you start to hear it from people that have lived 95 102 years and they they tell you this um you start to listen, or you should. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've experienced exactly the same thing. It's the it's the spiritual side. It doesn't need to be religious. It's the spiritual side of people's lives that mm. they will put at the top of the list. Yeah. The, you know, the, the oldest person I've spoken to this podcast, she was 102, she's 103 now. She has an extraordinary social life. She's got a great circle of friends. She is, uh, well, at 102, when I spoke to her, she's still heading out for lunch with her girls, as she calls them. She has a little <laughs> book club. They read books and get together and talk about them. And she she loves nothing more than having people around her. That that yeah. is the center of her life, and she hadn't she hasn't over her years given a huge amount of thought to, to what she's been eating. Or she she's quite she was a dancer in, when she was younger, so she's always been quite agile. Yeah. But it's the spiritual that mental side of her existence that I am convinced is, is a big part of what keeps her going. Yeah, I think um, it's, it's something to ponder, right? Um, which is that if you've mentally given up on life, you know, if you feel like you have no reason to be here. Do your cells and do your mitochondria and do your microbiota. Do, in other words, do your, does your DNA understand this emotional state and say, okay, well, we'll just, we'll just end it, right? So it's something to ponder. Like, do, if you have a reason to be here and you enjoy life and you want to show up every day, does that resonate and cause a, a change in state of the biology? And, and I would argue it does. I mean, there's research to suggest this, and, and Bruce Lipton's work is, is, speaks to this directly. Um, but, you know, I, I, I often think about that, right? Like if, if, if somebody doesn't have a reason to be here, does their body just say, okay, well, we'll just call it quits. It's, it's, it's cool. Mm. Well, <laughs> and, and there are examples of, of people getting to a, a certain age, perhaps losing a loved one, yeah, and their happens. body does give yeah. up on them. Yeah, this sort of heartbreak, right? Mm. And, it, and it really is just like, okay, well, that's it. Yeah, exactly. So what uh, I think I, I heard you say one day that you um, – in probably in another podcast – that you grow your own food and you, you try to live that simple – life yeah it's difficult I've, though isn't it this, it, it is I, i've gotten away from it unfortunately um but but this was something when i had a house in in seattle um yeah and i, I was growing my own food and it was and I, I didn't grow up knowing how to do that stuff right i mean to some to, when you start it's a little confusing you're not sure what to do and, and these type of things but it's got it so easy and you know you go to these gardening places and they'll you just ask them, hey, what kind of soil should I use? I'm trying to go with this. Oh, get this. I mean, you just learn, right, right mm. on the spot, let alone the internet and YouTube and all these things. But, yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, it's hard to get going. It's the hardest part is to start, to make the decision to start, right? Um, and this applies to everything, right? To make the decision and decide this is what I'm going to do, that's probably the hardest part. And once you get going, it's so easy. And, um, my God, I, I – Carrots and cucumbers and lettuce and jalapenos and garlic. I mean, this it, it, it's everywhere, right? And it's so easy. And I would literally go outside and like make my lunch for the day, just by picking up stuff out of my garden, and didn't have to wash it off. You know, I just wiped it off with my hands, and you know, now you're getting the soil biome in there. And I mean, there's so many beneficial aspects, but I think that the biggest one is, is that you start to appreciate food. So when I, 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 I overgrew carrots one time, <laughs> I, I just like threw a bunch of seeds and there's like I had n- tons of carrots and I couldn't eat them all. And, but what I recognized was like, man, I don't want to throw these away. Like they were in my fridge and I'm like trying to figure out how I can utilize these things, right? Like I was feeding some to my dogs. My dogs love carrots. I was <laughs> yes. giving them away to people. Carrot smoothies every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean literally. So this changed my relationship and that's what was the big takeaway for me. It was like, wow, because I know how long that carrot took to grow and I know, and I know, saw that process happening, there's no way I'm throwing this away. You appreciate it. hundred percent. So it's not, that showed me that it's not, it's, of course we don't appreciate food. Of course we're throwing things away. I mean, I, I've heard a number of statistics about how much food Americans throw away. And it's ungodly. I don't know what the oh, it's actual, obscene, isn't it? but we can feed like the whole world type of thing. Like it's, it's massive, right? So we don't appreciate these things because we don't know how long it takes to get them. And mm. uh, we don't know what it took to grow that thing. And so we just throw them away. And so it, it was really cool to, to sort of feel that. And I think this is it can be really powerful for children who don't like vegetables and stuff. Uh, you, I think it's really it will really change them if you give them some seeds and say, okay, these are your, this is your plot of carrots, right? And then they watch them grow and they, they, they water them and they, they, do, they see this. And this is theirs, right? They become proud of this thing that they, they did, right? And so then all of a sudden that changes their relationship with that carrot. And I think that, that will allow them to sort of enjoy vegetables and these type of things. So there's a lot of cool tricks and, and things that you gain out of this stuff. Um, but at the end of the day, it's cheaper. It's uh, more effective uh, for health. Um, organic carrots from 
any food store that you buy, even even the farmer's market, is not going to be as good as the carrots that you grow in your own soil, in your backyard, assuming that you're doing things even remotely correctly. Um, that's going to be more beneficial. So it, it's cheaper. It's better for your health. It's more convenient. Um, it's it's getting you outside. It's it's get, getting you away from Facebook, and you you can't tweet while you're you know doing some of this stuff. So uh, I think there's so much value now more than ever because we just need to get out of the house and get out of the technology a little bit and get our hands dirty. Getting out early in the morning as the sun oh, rises, it's the, best. the circadian rhythm in check, and and you're just focused on your thing, and like your mind doesn't wander. You know, uh, one of the guys that we spoke with in Costa Rica, he's 94, 91 now, I think, something like that. And he actually just retired like two years ago. And and so he said, I asked him what he what he what keeps him busy, and he says, Well, I just go out to the fields and I, I, I just hack down some of the fields with my machete. And he says it keeps my mind just uh, in one place. My mind doesn't wander, he and said. Physical exercise yeah, as well. Yeah, but his mind doesn't yeah. wander. So he goes out there just to hack these things with a machete, just so his mind doesn't wander. It's like, wow, that's that's kind of powerful. And it's, we don't, I mean, how many of us have uh, even five minutes of our day where our mind's not wandering, thinking about yesterday or tomorrow, what we got to do, right? I mean, we're so far off base. <laughs> and oh. this includes me, and I understand this stuff. It's almost out of control. <laughs> with the mind wandering, we're in a studio now, and there are little lights all over the place and screens. And it's, I think we're going to get to a tipping point. 100%. when and we, Maybe we're there at the moment when we're really going to acknowledge and realize that it's not doing us any good. Yeah, I think I think you're totally correct. I think first of all, five G. I think if 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 we implement that, that will be the deciding factor for everybody. I mean, I hate to break it to everybody, but five G is going to cripple us. Uh, it, it, it's the worst thing that we could ever do is implement five G on a wide basis. So that's going to tip us over if it, if we're not there already. Just but, just making it easier to check your lights uh, and no, five G is it really damaging for health. The actual technology. Oh, itself. the technology. Yeah, I thought you I mean, meant that what the technology but that, will uh, along one hundred percent with right. that too. So that's part of it too. But I mean, they're talking about five G micro. Uh, transmitters on uh, streetlights and, and blanketing the cities. And, and I mean, this is dangerous stuff and it's 40 times more powerful than 4G. And it, it's going to allow you to upload. I mean, so because of, so it, it's dangerous in and of itself. And then we're talking about blanketing. And then we're talking about the convenience that it will provide for us will now make us more reliant on it. So speaking to your point, so I think it's 100%. But I, I think, uh, I think you're right. I think there is, there is a tipping point and it's hard to be healthy in this society. And this is what also what I learned was that these people in these areas that we went to in the villages and these type of things, they were a product of their environment. So they, so it's kind of – it's a paradox. They were the ones creating the environment, but they're also a product of the environment. So in other words, what we put out mirrors back to us. So if we focus on good communities and strong communities and societies that are integrated, then we, we feed that and it in turn feeds us. And what we've done is we've separated ourselves from everything, right? I mean, you can be in here working uh, on whatever you do, editing a podcast and doing all these things and media stuff and get Uber Eats to deliver you food and you don't have to leave, right? And you can stand under these artificial lights all day, all night. You know, so we've created... Don't believe me, I won't do that. I won't be doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you won't. But this is the, this is the society we've yeah. created, right? And so I think the question that we have right now is how do we use all this really amazing technology and convenience to foster the things we know we actually want, which is community, which is slowing down, which is no, uh, elimination of distraction, right? So, and we can do that. We just have to make the decision. And we, first, we need to gain awareness of the things that we're doing wrong. And I think that's where we're at right now is still building that awareness. Which is exactly what you're doing with these documentaries. That's do, the goal. Do, have you, do you have themes for each of the individual films? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's sort of – it's a nine-part series and it does sort of tie in together. So it's all, it's all linked. But yes, we, we wanted to focus on a theme for each each episode. And you know, we, in the first two episodes, we talked about mitochondria and microbiota. So it's a little geeky. But if anybody's familiar with health and like it likes to think about health, they've all lo- everybody that's seen this so far has just loved it. Um, I was afraid it was going to be a little too geeky for people, but too much science. But actually, people that seem to seem to really enjoy it. I find people like science. Yeah, good good science. And and the goal is to show science a, a, to explain why simple things work. Right. So if I say having community is important for your health, and it's actually been shown that it's more effective uh, at, at extending life than quitting smoking, or in other words, not having a community is more damaging for your health than smoking. Uh, okay, how? Why? How, how, how did that work? Right? So, so the goal is to say, we need to do these simple things, and here's why. And we actually get into the science of microbiota and, 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 and uh, mitochondria. And, this is, this, and understanding those, this is, this is why we did it in the first two episodes, because if you understand those a little bit, 
then you can understand how to, what diet you should be following for you. Then you can understand uh, why taking care of the environment is so important. Then you can understand why circadian biology and circadian rhythm is so important, right? Uh, then you can understand why, why child birthing in the natural way and breastfeeding and, uh, you know, having a natural birth in a comfortable setting and these type of things are important. Then you can understand why purpose and community. And so th- by understanding just a little framework of how this works, we can understand all of our lifestyle decisions. Then now we can understand why yoga and meditation is beneficial because we understand how it's affecting us at the cellular level, which is ultimately what longevity is. So we have first to define longevity in biological terms and where it happens. And it's really at the cellular level that we see this. So, so we go through very practical things to help people understand why you would do this. Why would you get up out at, and go outside in the morning for 15 minutes and be in the natural light? What is that really doing for you? Well, it turns out it's doing quite a lot. And so we want to explain that. And so I think this is what I, caught, I found myself doing in practice, which was there were so, so many simple things I was trying to teach, and I had to explain the power of them and explain the complexity of them. Because if, if you just say, oh, yeah, here's a, I, I know you have cancer, but like what I want you to do is get up in the morning and go outside and go for a 10-minute walk. Mm. And they'd be like, okay, but, but I have cancer. Like yeah. how are you yeah. going to fix me? And then I have to explain, no, 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 here's why. It's insanely powerful at the cellular level, the hormonal level. Everything is changing. I want you to uh, narrow your feeding window from – you know, 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. And, and only eat in those hours. Yeah, but I have autoimmune disease. I want to fix that. I'm like, I know. This is what you're going to do. You're going to implement this sort of moderate intermittent fasting. And then I have to explain what intermittent fasting is and why it's important, right? Yeah, so, yeah. So, so this I've, is the goal. I've done much the same myself. And obviously, listeners to this podcast know that I've done a lot of periodic fasting as opposed to intermittent fasting. Yep. So periodic over a, a period of year, maybe four periodic fasts of, of five days, the, the fasting mimicking diet that I've been yeah. doing. But I went to Ecuador to meet a group of people with Laron syndrome. They have a genetic defect yep. that means they can't produce IGF-1, which is has been linked to cancer, having too much IGF-1. Yep, the growth factor, yeah. The growth factor, exactly. So how does that relate to fasting and diet? Well, fasting reduces your level of IGF-1. So uh, to, to, to take your point, it all comes back to the cellular level, yeah. what's actually happening. And this group of people were just a, a classic, beautiful example of, of something that was happening in a very sort of closed community because of a genetic defect, yeah. not because they were fasting, but the, the fasting will actually mimic the kind of condition that, they, that right. they have. Now, clearly, they don't have a growth hormone, which means that they're very short, three foot tall, which they don't like, and which is, and there are ways to perhaps get over that for them. But they, they keep on going, and they don't get the killer diseases of, of old age, I mean, right. almost well, without exception. And, and this is actually an interesting thing that I noted, and this is sort of a disempowering message, I will say, but uh, it's interesting from a scientific perspective, which is that almost everybody we talked to that was over, you know, in their 90s or 100s were tiny. I mean, like four foot four, you know, five foot one. I mean, the tiny, tiny people. And if we think about that, that kind of makes sense um, that that would foster longevity. Because if we think about the body as an energetic system, you know, less of the energy has to go towards things like muscle and the liver and these type of things. Um, they are more efficient with their energy than go to the brain, go to the heart, right? It can go to these vital organs. And I would actually put liver in that, in that category. Um, but, but it doesn't have to go towards big muscles and supplying a lot of function to a massive frame, right? And we know big, tall people don't live very as long, you know, statistically speaking. And so it's interesting to think, like, is that actually a mechanism of fostering longevity? Uh, there's downsides, right? I mean, if you're three foot five, then you, you can't do a lot of things that a six foot person can do. Right, um, you can do other things. So, so it's a trade-off, right? Everything's a trade-off. But and 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 it goes back to the point of none of that matters for quality of life. You can have a, an insane quality of life at three foot five, and you can have an insane quality of life at seven foot two. So again, it goes back to that same same idea, right? But but I think. It is interesting to think about how, oh, it's fascinating. how, how that plays yeah. a role. And, and also, the, the, so the counter-argument to that is that certainly this group of people I met, they did not like being three foot tall. Right. And th- they believed that they would have a better quality of life if they were the same as everyone else. Isn't that funny how yes. we always do that? They weren't so, <laughs> so happy about that aspect of their life. But, but they were actually very happy people, very jolly people. Yeah. So in, in many other respects of their lives, that they were having a, having a great time. I'm curious, in terms of your travels and the people that you've met, are there, one or two standout characters that will will stay with you for a long time. Uh, yeah, I mean, for sure, there was there was a ninety seven year old in in uh, Japan that we spoke with, and this lady blew me away. At ninety five, she was still 
climbing her orange tree, supposedly, uh, and picking oranges until her daughters told her, like, Mom, please don't do that in case you fall. And she was like, why? I'm fine, you know? Uh, to me, that was like, holy, holy smokes, really? And at 97, she walks two or three kilometers to her friend's house, who all, who's also 97. And they she walks there with her dog. And it takes her, like, you know, probably like an hour or two because uh, she's slow, but she walks there. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty pretty impressive. She, she can read the paper without glasses. She walks around barefoot. She she is chopping down sugar cane with her little tool. And she probably doesn't use any medication. She doesn't need them. No. And she's completely happy. And I asked her what her purpose was. And her purpose was to take care of her plot. She had all these things. And it, one of a, one of the guys that came with us, he was sort of helping us translate. Um, he, he asked her, like, what, the, what is this bush? You know, what is this? And what is this fruit? And, and she told him. And, and he's like, oh, wow, okay. Well, you know, where can I get one of these? And she's, she's like, oh, you can have this one. And he's like, wow, really? And so she, he was going to take this this plant. It was, I mean, it was in the ground. And she and he said, okay, I'll come back whenever to, to, help, to remove it. And she's like, no, no, I'll do it. So in 97, she's like offering, not only giving this plant away, this mm. this fruit tree uh, or fruit bush, but she was going to dig it out of the ground for him. And I'm like, oh, I don't know any 97-year-olds that you know operate that way. Mm. Um, so she she stands out, and she's uh, just an amazing person. Um, a, a couple other people, uh, Giulio is 105 uh, in, in uh, Italy that we spoke with, and he's still riding his bike. He's actually sort of a famous figure now um, because of his longevity and his, and his just his mannerisms. I mean, he's just a character. And you find this, right? I'm sure you found this too with all the oh, older people you spoke with. They're absolutely. hilarious. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're great. They're, I mean, you never know what you're going to get. You will sit down and the stories you will hear weren't what you were expecting. Exactly. But they're, they're always incredible stories. Did you go to Loma Linda? Because I know it's, it's designated as one of these so-called blue zones, mm -hmm. but maybe not in the same way as other blue zones around the world. But I've spent quite a lot of time and met a lot of people there. And I think still the, the, the Seventh-day Adventist mm -hmm. lifestyle, and again, I don't know personally that it's religion that's doing this or simply the lifestyle that the religion dictates. Takes. Right, but it certainly has a lot of the components that you've been talking about. Yeah. So sort of simplicity. We're recording this on a Saturday. Saturday is the is the Sabbath yeah. for, for yeah. people who follow that faith, and it's a day of of downing tools, putting the computer down, yeah. putting the anything digital down, and, and just spending time with family. Yeah, we we did go to La Melinda, and it's a it's an interesting place. I mean, I don't. It's not technically you know a blue zone as I understand it, um, according to Michelle Poulon. Um, you know, blue zones a trademark thing, so mm. it, who, they can say whatever they want. Oh, right, exactly. Uh, yeah, but according yeah. to Michelle. Poulon, his, he, it doesn't seem to be a tr uh, particularly statistically meaningful place um, in terms of the statistics. That said, I think it's still a fascinating case to, to look at and study. Yeah, I mean, I think the statistics that are interesting, if you just look through, the, not the, the entire town, but the, this community, this, yeah, exactly. and look at the the lifespan of, of, that they achieve, which yeah. is significantly higher than, than the rest of the United States. And that's why it's such a good thing to study, and because it's actually in San Bernardino area, which is kind of a, the armpit of California. Well, you, you, you turn off <laughs> Sorry, the, San Bernardino. Yeah, you, you turn uh, off the 10 freeway, and you, you're heading to Loma the, Linda, uh, and you're looking at all these fast food places. It's thinking, exactly the first thing I thought. What's yeah. special about this? I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Yeah. This is like, this is where I'm at. Uh, but it also, to me, it adds to the whole discussion point, which is that they don't have a particularly great local environment, I would say. Uh, but they do have a lot of hospitals. And they, they do, the town, the city itself is very health focused. So I think that is a critical component. And, and it's a model that we can follow going forward in the modern world, which is to say that if we sort of if we if we focus on health a little bit more and make it a priority in our cities and our towns and our villages, and it doesn't have to be through hospitals, but but somehow working that into the equation of of the necessary components of a good city is to really make that a, a focal point. Um, that can help, but but really their their faith and the way that they practice, I think, it does foster longevity because it it it, it works in the components that we we know to be useful, which is organic, a lot of plant foods, uh, whole foods, community. And the community is found in the church and, and through their social groups. So you have – I don't care what religion or group it is. It, community in and of itself is fostering that longevity, right? So you have that. Um, you have a day of rest, right? So you're relaxing. They spend a lot of time outside. Um, so their faith, I think, does promote – Good healthy habits, and I think a lot of faiths do. I mean, you find this in the in in the Christian faiths. You find it in all over, right? I mean, they all kind of do foster a lot of these same qualities. And I actually didn't grow up as a religious person, so again, it's one of those things I can kind of look at and say, okay, what 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 are they all saying, you know? And and what do I buy into? And I actually buy into a lot of the things um, that a lot of the faiths say. And it's it's very fascinating because I, I do think that. They, they all promote uh, a, a certain level of, of quality of life and of health and of community and of, of love and compassion. And we just – it's up to us to practice that way, right?
Yeah, and I, I was struck by their uh, actual devotion to exercise in that particular it's, time. Yeah, so it, the 94-year-old that we spoke with there gets up every morning uh, and rides her stationary bike and reads her scripture. And yeah. she's still playing violin. I asked her, I asked her uh, w- w- you know, her friends are all gone and most of them have passed away and her family's left. What keeps you going? And she said, well, I got to learn this song for the violin on Wednesday for this violin class. And I'm like, wow, this lady's purpose is to get better at the violin that she picked up two years ago. Mm. It, that, that is another common trait, isn't it? Purposeful living that 100%. you see everywhere. That there's, whether it's gardening, it gives you something to live for tomorrow. If it's yeah. looking after your dog or whatever it is, whatever your purpose in life is, it's, an, it's a reason to get to tomorrow. Yeah, and, and I think we, we've sort of bastardized this concept a little bit in the West, um, which is, you know, we, we take a capitalistic framework <laughs> of our purpose, right? We think it has to be something like Richard Branson or Elon Musk or, you know, uh, Steve Jobs. That That's the only purpose that, that's meaningful. And I think it's it's laughable. But um, and, and to some degree, I think we, we we probably even stress out over trying to find our purpose, which is counteractive, right? So, Well, if, if the purpose is to get rich, then it's going to bring stress as well. <laughs> right. Well, and I think if... if the purpose has to come about organically. I think if we're, if, we're, if we're focusing on something mentally, if we have this mental idea of what it, what it will take to make us happy, we're kind of missing the point, right? Because you, what, inevitably what everybody finds, and this is just through what I've experienced from hearing from other people, is that when you get there, you realize, oh, I'm not happy now. Mm. And so I think happiness is sort of a decision. And, it, it, and I think which – happiness is definitely a decision. Now – Making that decision may not be as easy as we think sometimes, but at the end of the day, like nobody decides your happiness except for you, right? There's nothing external that is going to create happiness. It's only a, de- a decision that you make in a state that you, you embody, right? So, so I think purpose can come about naturally, but it also doesn't have to be big. It can be small, you know, and it can be daily. It can change, you know. So, so purpose is a funny character that I don't know that we can really try to even identify. It's sort of this ghostly figure that we know when we have it, but we don't know how to find it, and yeah. nobody can teach us how to find it. Right? Yeah, and maybe it's better that we were not trying to define it and give it a a title or yeah. you know write a, you know, a, a specifically what it is for, for everyone because it is different for us all. Yeah, it's, it's impossible. But we to know find. when we. You, exactly. You just know. It's like love, right? Yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah. how do you define exactly. love? Yeah. I don't know. It's yeah. just, you know. Yeah, you know? <laughs> exactly. Um, I mentioned exercise there, the people of Loma Linda. Um, what's your exercise regime? I, so I think exercise is a fascinating one for our culture, don't you? I mean, it's, it's, we've really just gone all around uh, the whole wagon on this one. Um, I, I've done ev- just about every type of exercise. Um, I actually re- just really enjoy moving my body. Um, it's actually one of the things I miss about when I lived in Seattle and had a, a home to take care of in a garden, which was that m- that was physical activity and my mind was shut down. It's back to the old guy, right? My my mind was, was calm and my body was busy. And that, I really, really enjoyed that. So for me, exercise is anything that's going to sort of shut the mental process down and just allow me to move my body. Um, I, I've I've really reduced my workload uh, over the last few years. I think um, too much exercise is, uh, in, a, in a structured way can be probably more damaging than good, I think, uh, especially in our culture where we have too much other stresses. Um, so uh, for me, I, I just enjoy anything that's going to light me up. Um, and, and sometimes it's yoga, sometimes it's walking, sometimes it's sprinting, sometimes it's going to a gym and picking up heavy things and putting them back down. You know, it, it, for me, it's anything. Um, and I think the thing that we're, we're lacking right now is that we're not viewing exercise and movement as fun. And so whatever fun is for you, do that. You know, it's, if it's playing basketball, go play basketball. You know, if it's playing with your kids, go play with your kids. You know, but w- right now we're trying to do too many things because we feel like there's an answer in the workout space. Oh, I got to do higher, higher intensity interval training. I got to do this, uh, you know, CrossFit. I got to do – well, you don't have to do any of that. Um, and if you don't like it, then it's probably doing more damage than good. And you're not going to continue doing it anyway if you don't like it. So I think we're missing the point with exercise. Do whatever is fun or useful. <laughs> you know, uh, fixing up your house or painting your wall. I mean, if, if you're accomplishing something from that, you're going to get the dopamine spike from that. You're going to be like, you know, so proud of yourself. You're going to feel good that you accomplished something and you're going to move while you're doing it. Yeah, so, again. Oh, and that, again, comes back to the common trait that you see in these communities. They don't have gyms. Uh, that's they hilarious. Don't have 24 they don't hours even understand the exercise. Other. They're like, yeah. why would I exercise? I just worked all day. You know, that's ridiculous for me to exercise. And I think this is what we, if we're not careful, we will glorify the way that they live their life, right? We sort of think about this simplicity and this beautiful sort of integration with nature and they walked and they did a, oh, what a beautiful life that was. I think we have to be careful with that because from what I heard from these people, they worked their ass off. Mm. Um, they really did. I mean, uh, Julio was 105, like four foot four, four or whatever it was. Uh, 
he was telling me about how he, he worked. He did every job. He said I had every job imaginable. Um, but he one of his jobs was, was loading something up on a truck. I don't know what, what it was. Probably some food item. And he said he was loading. It was two or three guys, and they were loading sixty thousand pounds of goods onto this truck every day. And I'm like, oh my god, well, those are the deadlifts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I mean, that's hard work. And and oftentimes they would walk thirty kilometers to go to work, and then work, and then walk thirty kilometers home. Um, it's like 20 miles for the U S people, uh, that, that don't do math. Mm. Um, so I think there's, they, they didn't under, they don't understand leisure and work, uh, working out the, all they, their entire life was a it purposeful is, work. It is the lifestyle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it, do we want that? Like, I mean, I don't know. I mean, would you want to live that way? It sounds sexy. Mm. It sounds appealing well, because we don't have it, but at the same time. Well, no, yeah, and I was going to say, of course, we can't all, it just isn't practical. It's not going to happen. We can't all live in these lovely, quaint villages where that, that's how you live your daily lives, by lifting stuff and building, you know, well, loading lorries. We, we've got to live in these concrete societies and, and kind of make the best of it. And, you know, I go to a gym because I want to lift those weights. It's the best place to do it. Yeah. I run and ride a bike and swim nearly every day. Go to a pool and, and do that is kind of a social aspect of that as well. But, but you, you make the best of where you are. Hopefully. But what I, what I see is that we're not. And, right. you know, if you have a grocery store two miles away from you, who's walking to that grocery store and walking and carrying their groceries home? Nobody I know. So even when we have the opportunity to move and live like them, we don't. We choose not to. Uh, probably it's because of habit, and part of it's because I think we 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 feel like we don't have time. Yeah. So I think there is that component. But and, and, par- and part of it is that the cities and the towns that we live in are not built are not to structured do that. that way. There are no pavements. There are no yeah. sidewalks yeah. in many communities. Which coming from England to the United I, States, I <laughs> noticed big time that. How can I physically? You know, yeah. People joke about Americans not walking anywhere, but actually, it's not that easy. Especially in LA, that safe, right? Like, who nobody walks in, in LA. LA. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I remember that too. And, and one of my favorite places in Europe is uh, uh, is in Slovenia, Ljubljana, and they shut off like a couple square miles uh, of downtown to cars. So it's only a walking city. And in in, in, actually, the, the businesses were, I think, enraged when this was occurring. I think it's 2015 or 16 or something. They did, they made this decision, um, but now it's like. Business is booming. Tourism is booming. They got some European Green City Award type thing. And it's an amazing place because you're just walking everywhere and there's no – it's only walking, right? And even in like uh, Copenhagen is another great example of you have cars, bikes, walking, and public transport all like moving in this beautiful symphony, right? And I noticed that. I'm like, oh my gosh, you have to like understand the flow here. And it's all working together. So I think you're right. There, there is a component. But go to an airport. What, look what happens in an airport. You know when your flight's leaving. So – it's not like, you know, and most people are in a rush anyway, and yet they still take the escalator and yeah. stand there. Or they get on the, the people mover, like, and they just stand. Yeah. So I know. I know. You see what I'm see saying? It so it's time. like, it's, given the choice, most people will take the easy. Nobody takes the stairs. Yes. A subway, right? New York City, lots of people walking around. Very few people actually take the stairs. And I'm not criticizing. It's just, it's, it's a simple observation that we, even when we understand the value of movement, and, and it's not working out. It's constant movement. We're still not programming ourselves the right way. And so I think you're right. I think we need to be better as a society fostering that, yeah. but also individuals. If, if we decide that that's what we want, then the cities respond. So again, it's like organic food. If we mm. want organic food and we buy organic food, the people who want to make money off food is going to go, oh yeah, maybe we should do more organic because <laughs> yeah. that's where all the profits are going. Yeah. So we decide it in the end every time, right? So how do we want to build our cities? How do we want to uh, interact with our so yeah you're absolutely right the onus is on us to make changes i mean you can make excuses but it is possible to and, and i play that game too right i mean yeah. i don't walk to the store every time right so yeah. uh, and and again it, it, this is where i think we have to open our minds to looking at the bigger picture every time you're driving instead of walking when you could have walked or ridden a bike you're polluting the environment a little bit right mm-hmm. and it's you know it's every little bit right so again i think it's just these are the hard things that we're going to have to come to grips with is like, how do I make every decision that's that's moving us in a better direction as a society? And again, doing that will, will foster longevity in the kids and then their kids. So it's it's a ripple effect, you know. Let me just ask you in, in closing, what, and I ask everyone this question, do you have your own longevity goals? Do you have uh, an aspiration to live to a certain age? Do you have an image of yourself as, uh, actually, how old are you now? 37. You're 37 now, so you're young. Yeah. So do you have a, a goal? I don't, no. I, my only goal is to uh, be as present as I can be in today. Uh, it's the only way I understand 
and I'm not always successful at that, but it's the only way I can understand how to foster uh, happiness. Um, because if my goal is to live to whatever, 102, what am I doing today? Right. Uh, t- I mean, technology, we, we can't see the future. I mean, 10 years, technology is going to be insanely advanced. So I'm sure there's things that are going to help us get there. Uh, but, but again, it, to me, it comes back to the, to the point of what am I doing today? It, all you have is today. So who cares about 100 years from now? It doesn't even make sense to think in those terms. So uh, spiritual texts talk about this. You know, it's, it's talked about everywhere. But I think it, 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 in the health game, that's, it's the same thing. How can I be as present as I can be and happy today? And whatever happens in the future happens, you know? Yeah, and I hear that so often. Spoke to someone the other day who'll be on a future podcast, 82 years old, gave exactly the same answer. That wow. it, it's all about today and making the best of today. And I think it's interesting when you talk to older people and you ask them about their past and their, you start to pick up these. Words. I forgot who it was. Somebody interviewed this, wrote a book about basically interviewing people on their deathbed. Right, and I think that's where we get the wisdom. That's where we get the life reflection and be like, what's important? They and they all tend to say the same type of things, right? So, like, why are we trying to reinvent the wheel and think we have a better answer when we're thirty-seven? Right? I, I need I need to be listening to those people, and if I can do that and try to integrate that the best I can, even though I'm still ignorant and don't understand, because I mean, we we at eighteen we don't understand what it's like at forty, right? At forty we understand, but we don't understand what it's like at eighty. So we can't understand that until we get there, I think, and so best we can do is try to understand it from somebody else's perspective, try to embody that as best we can. And then over the years we go, oh yeah, okay. I was kind of an idiot when I was 37. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I think it's just, it's kind of human nature that we never fully appreciate where we are in life. And an 18 year old actually might want to be 25. And how bad do you want to be 18 now? Yep. Yeah. The 40 yeah. year old wishes you're still 18. And yeah. Yeah. How can we watch the documentary? Yeah. So it's, it'll be on our, uh, on the website, uh, human longevity, uh, film.com and, and uh, it'll be live May 7th for free. And our goal is to show uh, an episode each day. So for 24 hours, you'll have access to episode one for free. Um, episode two will be the next day, etc. cetera. So uh, the goal is to, to really get some awareness around this topic. And uh, I think when we do that, things will start to change, right? Again, I think we're in the awareness building stage. And so that's really the goal of this film. And, um, and it, it's available for purchase as well. I, the thing is, is that we interviewed so many people and so many amazing people, and, and the, especially from the expert standpoint, that we couldn't get all of their content in. I mean, you know this. It's like you, you have to cut that's some amazing level, stuff. Yeah, like, exactly. This is it's, such a great quote. Really tough, isn't it? And so we have to – we want to make that available because there's so much wisdom and knowledge that, that is left out of the film. So you know, people can, can purchase that stuff too. And, and I think – the part of this, we wanted to make a bigger impact than just the message. And so uh, we, we partnered with some pretty amazing organizations that are helping to save, uh, you know, babies and mothers that are struggling with complicated pregnancies, you know, that usually end up in, in some sort of mortality. So uh, – and, and these are low-resource settings typically around the world, and, and they don't have the uh, the ability to, to, to really – make an impact there. So so that's where a lot of the money is going. Um, we're donating to these organizations to help save those children and the mothers uh, that are struggling with infant mortality in, in regions. And again, the whole goal, I think, for us is to uh, foster longevity in any way possible. And uh, I think it starts with the kids. It's great that you're doing that. Yeah. I can't wait to see them. Yeah, it's 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 been a fun process. I can't wait to be fully done <laughs> done with it, and and move on to the next phase and 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 uh, feel good about it. But but it's been uh, fantastic. To I, I I I'm already looking back on this and be like, wow, it was pretty lucky that we mm. could go visit these these yeah. people and, and, and speak and, with them. And you're feeling you're just feeling the pressure of editing at the moment. Yeah, yeah. I've, it's, I've, I've, I've seen deadline. this before, and, and you know, in a year's time, you look back and oh, they, they were great days. Yeah, yeah. There yeah. was some pressure, but and, they were great days. And it's funny because I actually am aware of that, right? Yeah. So even in the stressful stuff, I'm like, oh, this is this is the fun stuff. Don't forget, like, and I know that I'll feel that way, right? So it's again, it's sort of like trying to be in the moment of yeah. like enjoying the stress and enjoying this chaos because you know it's all you got today <laughs> Jason I've really enjoyed this we, we could keep on talking <laughs> I know. for a long time but uh, we've got to close here all the best with this documentary thank you series. so much I think it's, it's a really great project and thanks so much yeah and I will in fact put all the details I'll link to the trailers and link to Perfect. the documentaries awesome. in the show notes for this episode and on the website at llamapodcast.com that's double L-A-M-A podcast.com and you can follow us in social media at Llama Podcast on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter where the direct message box is always open if you'd like to get in touch that way or you can send me an email to peter at llamapodcast.com Many thanks for listening.
Health optimization is what this podcast is all about, and that means taking care of our mitochondria, the energy centres of our cells. Physical strength, avoiding frailty, is key, and that's why the science behind urolithin A and the work of Timeline Nutrition is so interesting. You can find out more and get a discount code at our website and in the show notes for this episode.